This is my wife, Rachel. She is the best wife ever, and she's the only person I know who would let me slap all this goop on her face to make this project possible. So the first step is life casting. These are some of the materials I used in life casting. You can see the plaster bandages, the tray with salt in it, a uh, body double from Smooth On. This is the trial size kit. I heavily recommend getting the uh, thinner for the splash coat, which I did not do, and I also thoroughly recommend uh, keeping the temperature in the room at, at the recommended temperature, otherwise it will cure up so fast that you will not get it out of the bucket and onto the face. Another shot of the plaster bandages and the salt. little picture of the set up. Rachel sat in this chair and the uh, drop cloth was definitely necessary to catch all the goo. So before we started we did an allergy test. I applied the release cream to Rachel's hand and we did a little test blob on her hand and just made sure that she wasn't going to break out in a rash uh, while we were putting this on her face. Also tested some earplugs. We we're going to actually mold the ears, and this kept the body double from going ear. Another picture of the ear. It's important to have a skull cap to protect the hair, otherwise the body double mechanically locks to the hair. Uh, also, as an aside, there is a body double intro. Sorry, there is a smooth on introduction to life casting video that uh, that shows you how to use this product and I recommend watching it about 10 times before you even think about starting. So this is a non-latex skull cap that has been adhe adhered to the head using spirit gum. You can see it's kind of a patchwork quilt. I had no idea what I was doing. Notice the earplugs are... This is the first pass with the body double just mixed up and applied according to the smooth on directions and also the introduction to life casting video. Uh, you can see here that it looks like I applied it all at once but actually I started it at the top of the head and worked my way down uh, leaving openings for the nostrils. Once again just watch the smooth on video for the instructions on that. Another picture, picture notice the drops on the chin. Uh, possibly could have used some sort of thickener here to keep these drips from from happening. So I c could probably have done a splash coat uh, with the thin silicone to get the detail and then thickened it up to do the backing coats. Here's a side view. You can see I did not body double on the back of the head because I have no interest in molding that correctly. Uh, lots of monster pictures here. Lots of fun. Pretty amazing. amazing. So now we get to the support shell using the plaster bandages. Once again this is a shot that shows the after because at the time I was way too busy to take pictures and my hands were covered with plaster. But essentially you uh, just start off laying plaster bandages around the head. You overlap. You do a flange that goes around the border of the whole support shell and then you just add several layers. Once again the smooth on video has some great examples of that. A uh, big note here is not to go behind the ears at all or the support shell will mechanically lock to the ears and make it very difficult to remove. I was right on the edge of doing that. More pictures. Notice that she can still breathe. Notice that she can still and she can still breathe. So this was the first, my first life casting attempt and you can see here that it did not turn out so well because the room was hot. Uh, the first side of her face that I did was actually curing before I could get it on her face giving a kind of melted appearance. And again the same thing. Here is an UltraCal 30 positive that I poured in, making the melted face look more
what not to do. Okay, so needless to say, I did another live cast where I was more careful about the speed at which I worked, the temperature of the room. Unfortunately, I still thought I could get away without the thinner, which was probably a mistake, but it turned out not to cause me too many problems, although I do recommend it. So with a live cast in hand, I prepared a, a working space and a more suitable environment, although probably not ideal. Here's a collection of all my molding materials, 6 mil plastic on the floor, uh, a lot of stuff here. So the next step was to make a Chavant NSP clay positive uh, into this life cast mold. I used a crock pot to melt the Chavant. I think I probably used about 7 or 8 blocks of Chavant for this process. This crock pot was nice because it had a temperature probe, but let me set the temperature to 180 degrees, was, which was just on the far side, just at 5 degrees or so hotter than what was required to liquefy the Chavant, which made pouring very easy. Here's a picture of the second life cast. You'll notice that uh, there aren't too many problems with it. Here's the Chavant NSP. The lack of sulfur is very important for this application because it uh, sulfur can keep ceric platinum silicone from setting up, so having sulfur-free Chavant was very important. This is what it looks like when you melt it up in a crock pot. I splashed it in uh, with a brush, trying to get a chip brush, trying to get all the detail. Uh, once I got that, I just started slopping it in, pouring a little bit in, and slapping it up to the, the edges to build thick you can see here I've done shavings of the chiffon into the crock pot just to warm them up and make them pliable. So I'd throw in a strip, get it nice and flexible, and then just lay it into the uh, mold, building up thickness, melting more clay. Here you can see I've turned down the heat so it's not quite as liquidy as before. So here, there are a couple of steps that are missing, but basically I uh, built up a little wall around the uh, edges of the silicone to raise the level, and then I poured in some UltraCal 30 with uh, burlap for structural support, and in the middle of that I inserted a threaded pipe that I'm going to use as an armature. Once that had all set up, I used uh, some more Chavants and built out the back of the skull. So here's a longer picture of that showing the pipe more clearly. Threaded pipe has now been inserted into a 2x2 two 2 3 quarter inch plywood base with a an attachment screwed into the board that the threaded pipe is stuck to. The plaster support shell and the inner silicon mold are still attached to the clay. Another shot of that. Remove the plaster sh support shell, just showing the silicone life cast. Another shot. Silicone life cast removed, showing just the Chavant clay underneath close-up of that, you can notice that there are many defects corresponding to where the skull cap was. Also just lots of little random defects in the face. The ears are very, very... A little bit of goop in the eye in the corner of the mouth. There are really two kinds of defects. One kind of defect is there's material there that's not supposed to be there, like in the corner of the mouth and the eyelashes. And the other defect is, is that there's missing material, like around the shot of that. Another shot. Another shot. Notice how bad the ears are and the goop around the neck. Another shot of that. So the next step is to clean this up. Uh, 
All right, so here some cleaning has been omitted, but basically I just used some standard sculpting tools that I picked up, not knowing what really to look for from Hobby Lobby and other arts and craft stores. Uh, there is a video by Brick in the Yard, Fundamentals of Silicon Skins, that shows some tools, but quite frankly, uh, those tools I did not find to be very helpful for this process. I used a different set of tools, uh, but essentially you can do this with a uh, small kind of uh, spade or pick tools, also loop tools for smoothing, possibly rake tools. There'll be some pictures of that later on. So here I've carved out an eye socket because the eyes need to be sculpted open to do the uh, pour of the, the real silicone skin that will cover our robot. So there's an eye in this. You can see some of the cleanup on the back of the head. This is very preliminary. The back, back of the head is in very rough form. I've added a little bit of material to this ear. Likewise on the other side, I've added some material to the ear and made a huge, huge ear. Uh, cleaned out some of the life casting uh, skull cap lines, but still very... F so I used some plastic eyes that I had just sitting around from a Halloween animatronic. Cut them into slivers because the orbs themselves were way too big, maybe 40 millimeters. So, way too big for the face. And I inserted these to kind of give myself a guide of how to sculpt the surrounding eyelids and so forth. Uh, I tried to orient them so that they were both looking at the same point in space, both eyes. And they were basically the right depth. They ended up being a little flat because of the curvature of the, the orbs, was, was too. So here's another picture of that from the side. You can see the gaps behind the eyes. Another picture, you can see the gaps under the eyes. There's a close-up picture. You can see the gaps. Basically, at this stage, I started referring to uh, Mark Alfrey sculpting the human head video, which was useful in terms of seeing how to work the clay, uh, how to remove and add, and generally work with it but his model is an old man, and so his specific instruction on the eyes was not particularly useful. Uh, there was only about 30 seconds of it at best, and the heavy folds and so forth around the eyes just don't apply uh, in this particular case. But the basic premise that he used, or some of the basic steps, are useful. So essentially you would throw in some bits of clay behind the eyes to behind the plastic shells of the eyes to secure them in place, uh, roll up some tubes of clay and kind of put them around the eyes to hold them in place and also form the initial eyelids. That's essentially how the upper and lower lids just by rolling up clay and smushing it in. This is a photo to show the depth. So you can see here that the curvature of the eye is a little flat. But I think the depth is essentially okay better picture of the same. So here some work has been done but not as much as you might think. Maybe a little bit of cleanup all the way around and as I said before uh, lids are created by rolling up tubes of clay spatulating them on to the eye the, the proper, proper point above and below and then kind of flattening them out and doing a nice cut across the plastic so that the line is, is smooth and even. Um, one thing that's interesting here about the eyes is that they're not just ovals. Um, they're actually two slightly different types of curves. And if you really look at an eye, you'll see that the, the top uh, lid is an arc that starts at a point, goes high, and then ends a little bit higher on the face than the starting point. And the lower lid is a similar arc, except that it starts inward slightly of the upper lid and goes up and comes in slightly uh, below the upper arc. So the upper arc of the eyelid is always above the lower lid, both in the front and the back.
So you're really talking about two different arcs uh, rather than an oval shape. Okay, here we are again. So another photo of the same. Could be that some cleanup has taken place. Basically, as I said before, some places there's material that there shouldn't be. There's clay that there shouldn't be. Bumps of various kinds. And in other places, there's clay missing. For example, around the nostrils, there was clay missing. Around the ears, there was clay missing, etc. Here's a little close-up of the eyes I used. I guess this is slightly out of sequence here. So in the process of sculpting the clay, I realized that I needed quite a few reference photos to figure out what things were actually supposed to look like. So here's a reference photo of the eye. You can see here that the upper lid does extend above and continues on past the lower lid towards the ear. Also see some of the there. The eyes from a different angle. The eyes from a different angle. More eyes and an ear. Eyes straight on. Some of these were also useful for matching the skin color later on when we were coloring with silicone. And a very useful photo of the ear, albeit slightly blurry. So here's a little bit more work on the eyes. It looks like the lids are thicker here. Looks like the nose has been somewhat repaired, smoothing. There's a little bit more on the eyes. You can see here that uh, I haven't followed yet my own uh, rule about the upper lid and the lower lid being two separate arcs, although there's some hint of that there. But you can see that the upper lid is there. It's not too, too lidded. It's not too heavy. And the little red ball in the corner of the eye is also there. And I've tried adding some texture just as an experiment. This is the left ear, which at the time I was quite happy with and I don't think I really changed too much up to the f here you can see I've started adding material to the back of the head building it out uh, no real reference for this other than just the thickness of my own head and what seems to look about right a side view of the whole shebang at this point you can see that the neck is uh, unfinished towards the back but the ear looks okay there's another close-up. The nose is looking pretty good at this point. The right ear still needs quite a bit of work. The lips good. Another photo of the same. Okay, so uh, on Chris's advice, I just made the lids more, more heavy so the silicone and the eyes would not have as far to stretch during blinks. So this is the height that we ended up with. It uh, looks like I've done a little bit of work on the, the right ear to bring it into a closer form with the left ear. It's a frontal view of the lidded eyes. Uh, notice that they still need a little bit of work. They're not quite as clean on the upper lid and in the corners the upper lid does not uh, overlap the lower lid. I think this is more or less the final picture of the the left ear. Notice that there's some extremely heavy texture marks in the area surrounding the ear. Uh, this was based on some advice I got in the Brick in the Yard video to use a bristle brush to apply skin texture. Uh, that was not really suitable for this application. So I ended sculpting it out. Here's a little bit of a far away, far away look. Uh, I've cleaned up the neck quite a bit. I've extended parts of the, the back of the neck. Just starting to take a little bit of, uh, of a clean-up approach to this. Another view of the ear. I believe this is actually the opposite ear revert. I did that. I took a photo of uh, the left ear, reversed it in Photoshop, printed it out, and used it as a reference for the opposite ear so I didn't have to keep looking back and forth, back and forth. So at about this point, this is when Chris joined me. Hooray! So uh, one issue, one of the first issues that we dealt with was the height of the armature. So that threaded pipe was rather high. And since the base of the neck really should be a flush with the uh, project board from the standpoint of building a small mold, 
using as little material as possible, we started building a platform for the head to essentially sit on to, to create an elevated platform. So a uh, part of that was using some cardboard to quick, quick make a form and then we uh, followed on with some plaster bandages and ultracal and uh, wood for the platform base. So one thing that I was amazed by when Chris came was uh, all the different tools he had for sculpting the clay. Uh, some of these tools you can buy but some of these tools you more or less have to either make or get from a specialty store. So the tool with a large uh, brown handle is a rake. I believe the uh, material next to that, the kind of light uh, red colored and brown material is uh, drywall sandpaper. The tool next to the rake is a tool that Chris made using uh, guitar bass wire and uh, inserted that into a uh, brass pipe or copper pipe with epoxy putty to hold it in. And there were several loop tools like that that were extremely useful. Um, several of them did have uh, wire coiled around wire to give a kind of very light rake texture that was very useful. Some of them were uh, a simple kind of squished loop so it was more pointed. Others were a flat loop like this tool to give a uh, broad contact with the surface. And various very small loops using a thin guitar wire, a single strand wire, were very useful in sculpting out some of the uh, details in highly convex areas such as the eyes. So close up of some of these tools, you can see that some of these uh, loop tools that look like more conventional ceramics tools actually have wire wrapped around them to give them more of a raking function. Another very useful tool uh, that Chris introduced me to is this brush that's been flattened out at the tip and basically you uh, soak that in as pure alcohol as you can find so like 90 percent plus and that kind of breaks up the the clay a little bit and then you can do some very 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 fine smoothing with that and also add some texture. Uh, apparently there is a great great uh, substance that you can use besides alcohol to uh, accomplish some of this but I cannot remember what it is and we could not find it easily at our hardware store so I'll have to ask Chris about that that's a note to self to ask Chris what that was okay so here we're continuing to build up the base uh, that I mentioned earlier. These are plaster bandages around that cardboard uh, support shell. Here we're mixing up some UltraCal 30 uh, which I got from General Brick and Shale. Uh, I could get a hundred pound bag for 20-25 bucks. Uh, here he's mixing it thick so we're going to a dry lake bed kind of appearance by slowly sifting it in on top of the water not mixing at all until we're basically done. Thick there and then throwing it around the plaster support shell. Uh, another set of tools that Chris introduced me to that were very useful are these these kind of ceramic shaping tools. They're, there's one here on the project board on the right hand side. They're usually a flat piece of uh, metal. Uh, some of them are, are curved in a straight half moon kind of way. This one is curved in a slightly more dramatic way. Uh, there was also one that had uh, teeth, so it functioned as a rake. All very useful for shape. Okay, so here's a another picture of the UltraCal pedestal. And here's a front-on of the sculpture. You can see it's, uh, it's in pretty good shape. We haven't done skin texture yet, but uh, Chris uh, helped me out quite a bit on the upper lid. So you can see the upper lid now overlaps the lower lid. So it adds a little bit of realism and I think just in general we, we tightened up the eyes a little bit. He uh, took my more oval shaped eyes and helped make them a little bit darks. So now we add a base of 2x4s uh, uh, that are sitting on uh, pieces of scrap 2x4 but these are all connected together and form a little platform or 
around the pedestal for all of the weight of the mold to sit on. And you can see that we've sealed the joints with uh, UltraCal and also the gap between the 2x4s and the pedestal itself we've sealed with UltraCal, uh, which is actually resting here on some uh, hidden plaster banded. Here's a side view of the same, so you can see the 2x4 supports. I quite liked our little uh, uh, elevated platform there. So now we are prepping the sculpture to make the mother mold. And in this picture you can see that we've uh, done a, a line that goes over the sculpture. The sculpture itself has been wrapped in saran wrap to uh, protect it. Here detail is not important because we're making a mother mold. Uh, but the uh, dotted line is important because it is basically tracing out the uh, widest part of the sculpture in that dimension. So you can see that it goes over the ears. And we're going to end up tracking that line quite closely as we build the mother mold. Some more uh, saran wrap. A little picture. I guess that's slightly out of sequence with the pre- And here we've traced on our elevated platform an outline of where we think the mother mold will go, its general shape, and uh, how thick it should be. It ended up being a little bit thicker. Uh, putting on of the saran wrap. This looks like it's slightly out of sequence. Okay, so with the saran wrap on and all of our lines drawn, we can start cutting out clay slices of uh, even thickness and putting these on our clay sculpture. Here's an example of the cutting tool that's used. It's essentially a piece of wire stretched between two handles. The clay itself is sitting on a cutting board. The cutting board has a border of plywood that is all of an even thickness. And so when you rest the uh, cutting wire across those uh, edges and then pull through the clay, you get an evenly thick piece of clay. So here's the first strip being put on. Some more strips. You can see we're basically starting at the top and working down. The pens uh, put into the clay are marking our uh, horizon line or, or line that's we drew earlier on the saran wrap that's marking the widest part of the sculpture in that plane. Adding more clay. So all the clay has been added. You can see the pins are added going all the way down. Now it's just being smooth. More smoothing has taken place. A little bit of, of uh, water, I think, and also these handy dandy tools that Chris has, the uh, pieces of flat metal. Cutting some clay uh, using that a piece of wood there, that paint stick, as a guide. So we've cut it, the clay to an even thickness, and now we're cutting them pieces of clay into strips. Those strips form ribs that provide uh, registration marks or keys that will end up causing the inner silicon mold to uh, register quite nicely and fit exactly into the outer uh, or mother mold using some uh, paper towels in the back there to keep the clay wet as we work. More ribbing here in the back. We're going to come back and clean this up. Ribbing in the front. have a nice cross pattern across the eyes and over the nose. Ribbing at the edge. Here this picture shows the small notch that uh, is at the very base here. So if you look at the UltraCal pedestal, you can see that there is a small notch that will help seat the inner silicone mold into the UltraCal gel. So now we're smoothing this to make it a little bit nicer. More smoothing. Okay, this picture shows the very important inner rib. So we first had ribs projecting outward uh, from the from the clay uh, blanket and these inner ribs are actually projecting perpendicularly from those initial ribs so this just provides an extra degree of locking. 
another picture of the additional ribs or inner ribs I think I call them another picture of the inner ribs so now we're building the flange that will support the two shells of uh, UltraCal so there's a front and back UltraCal shell that are part of the mother mold we're going to do these in two steps so the first step we did the front and that flange basically separates the front from the back and we've got some uh, junk clay uh, sticking to uh, that saran wrap there just to support that flange so this is just more work on the front part before we apply the ultra cowl using some paper towels to keep the clay from drying out you can see the flange we're trying to get a fairly even uh, flange but right here towards the bottom it's a little bit thicker at the, the neck region just to make clamping a little bit easier I think here's another picture of the junk clay supporting the flange from behind okay so what we have here is the front uh, we've got the clay blanket the ribs the inner ribs and the flange this is all water-based clay and you can see that into the flange projecting outward we've got these nice trapezoidal uh, registration marks or keys and this will help the front and back part of the UltraCal jacket to lock together so so basically whenever we use water-based clay in any of the following steps this water-based clay is essentially providing uh, some kind of, of negative space so what uh, is initially convex becomes concave or is just otherwise filled with some other material alright so we're getting real close to actually doing the UltraCal jacket here you've got the junk clay supporting the flange and on top of that we've got some plaster bandage to provide even more support because that ultra cow okay we're just about ready to go here alright so some important steps first thing is is that stone likes wood so you have to release everything that the stone will touch that is wood or uh, or stone release it with Vaseline so we've got chip brush with Vaseline and we brush all the wood surfaces with that then we need to prep the water-based clay so that the ultra cow will uh, uh, not have any sort of moisture transfer problems between the water-based clay and itself uh, and also so that the ultra cow will basically adhere to the water-based clay and not completely schluff off so we use uh, Krylon crystal clear I believe we did two possibly three coats of that and uh, used a hair dryer I think to accelerate and then uh, one coat possibly two of dulling spray that's a good thing to ask Chris about to, to get the, the final get the real number we used uh, the dulling spray basically helps the ultra cal grip once you put the crystal clear on there's no real surface for the ultra cal to grip so the dulling spray provides that okay here's our first kind of splash coat of uh, UltraCal uh, using the same kind of mixing method for UltraCal that I described earlier so here we've got looks like a finished splash coat covering the front part now we're coming back with that uh, and using burlap bandages soaked in a little bit stiffer UltraCal so much in the same way that a life cast is performed uh, we're applying burlap uh, bandages sorry I believe I said burlap earlier burlap bandages over the ultra cal the burlap bandages are soaked in ultra cal continue to apply burlap bandages uh, note that we're applying one very large roll of bandages uh, across the flange to provide some some good uh, structural support there at the flange because we're going to be clamping that later uh, looks like a, another roll of burlap so we're double making a double thick uh, flange okay so uh, magically some stuff has happened and it looks like our uh, front uh, support shell or front ultra cal jacket is completed it's dried out and now we've removed the junk clay 
uh, from the back and we're removing the saran wrap from the back to reveal the uh, water-based clay that we will now be creating a jacket for. So uh, we are creating additional kind of registration marks uh, using a piece of water-based clay here. Uh, sorry, not registration marks. These are the pry points that we will use to pry the two sides of the UltraCal jacket apart. Uh, at various times we'll need to when we do do castings. So here a piece of water-based clay has been applied to the back of the UltraCal jacket. Uh, this will become a pry point, this will become a hollow, and we're using an arrow to mark this so we can find it later when we want to pry these two things apart. So once again, I uh, need to release everything with Vaseline. need to release the back of this front uh, UltraCal jacket with Vaseline so the back UltraCal jacket does not stick to it. These are all the pry points that we've made, all in water-based clay. Okay, magically, magically, the back uh, jacket, UltraCal jacket, is now done. Basically the same steps as before. Here's it from another viewpoint. Take a nice rasp, rasp it down a little bit, make a smoother edge. So the UltraCal is set up and we're ready to pry the two sides of the jacket apart. This is a really fun procedure. Uh, you use two, two flat bladed screwdrivers with long, long handles and popsicle sticks and hopefully a friend to help you. Uh, you squeeze it out just a little bit, separate the two just a little bit, and then shove in popsicle sticks to maintain that distance. And then just you just add one more popsicle stick at the same place each time. So one popsicle stick, two popsicle sticks, three popsicle sticks each time, widening it just a little bit more until the two sides are really ready to come apart. Uh, you do this very gradually all the way around. You don't start at the top and widen it ten popsicle sticks in the bottom one. You work very evenly around and hope, hope that you don't crack anything. So here's a two popsicle stick thickness. From the top, you can see the top is opening up. Okay, once you get a certain level of thickness and you can get your fingers in there, you can just pull the two pieces apart. Uh, one thing that I didn't uh, say before that I think is now apparent is that into the actual platform itself, we uh, drilled some uh, drilled some holes, so we smoothed out kind of a, a dimple into the board, and that provided a registration mark between the mold itself and the board. Uh, that's important to get locking in that dimension. So here we're just prying. We finished prying apart. You can see some of the clay blanket is uh, sticking to the mold, but hey, we don't care. So very importantly, uh, once we remove the clay blanket, we save all of the clay and weigh it because that clay blanket that we've laid is the negative space for our inner silicone uh, mold. And by keeping track of how much clay we used, we can figure out how much silicone we need to use. There are two ways of doing that. There's a volume calculation and a weight calculation. And here we've used a weight calculation. Okay, once we get the mold apart, everything cleaned out nicely, it's time to lock it together again. So when we actually pour the inner silicone jacket, we're going to go ahead and pour whatever's left over uh, to make ribs for the brush-on mold. So Chris here is using some foam core and a hot glue gun to make a little uh, rib, rib mold that we will pour leftover silicone into. Okay, so one thing that we did not do earlier uh, is finish the, the sculpture itself. Uh, the making of the mother mold didn't really affect the sculpture, didn't hurt it at all, so we went ahead and did that and kind of got our thoughts together as far as, as texture. So here uh, we're getting ready to apply texture to the sculpture. The saran wrap laid over it is a nice way of uh, of kind of keeping the clay in place. If you just stick a tool into it, it has a tendency to divot and project out 
material but if you put saran wrap over it it tends to just make a dimple so here are two tools that we used one is a needle like tool the very small ball at the end that makes kind of a pore the other is uh, this common clay working tool the one on the, the left and if you use just the point of that and tap it into the clay it makes a more directional type pore uh, we also ended up using uh, another tool that had some kind of sharp irregular edges like a little prong and that made a kind of a deeper irregular type pore. So uh, here we are after the texture has been applied. Um, this is nice because it breaks up the light so when a light shines on our final silicone skin it will not look glossy which would be totally unrealistic. There's a close-up so you can see there's quite a bit of texture on the nose around the eyes. Oh, another tool that we used here, you can see the effect on the eyelids, was a uh, custom uh, loop tool that Chris made. It had a, a flat uh, end uh, of its loop and basically that was used to press into the clay and make very fine horizontal lines so the wire was very, very thin. There's another picture of the same. really like the way the lips turned out really really nice uh, most of the texture on the flume and above the lip is actually from the original uh, silicone life cast probably every all this would have turned out even better if I had used the uh, splash coat for that life cast. yet another picture of the fully textured head so now we're getting ready to pour our inner silicone mold so we've drilled a, a hole with a large circular drill bit into the back of the UltraCal jacket and we have hot glued in a uh, paper towel tube into the back of that and that paper towel tube is the point from which we will pour uh, silicone into the mold and the length of it is useful for uh, adding back pressure so we're sure that the silicone goes into every nook and cranny. Here's another picture of the same. You can see the hot glue. Looks like some more pictures of the textured. More pictures of the textured sculpture. Textured sculpture. Uh, don't think we've released it with anything in particular here. It's just the regular straight up clay. Okay, so uh, here you can see that the outer jacket is settled in place. It is registered with the dimples that we drilled earlier in the project board platform. So all we have to do now is put the front part of the jacket. Another picture of the same. Okay, so here we've clamped the front and back together. Uh, we are in the process of doing some hot glue to keep silicone from escaping. Um, notice also that we have drilled uh, escape holes into the UltraCal jacket all the way around in multiple tiers. So along the bottom we have drilled, looks like uh, five or six holes here in the back and I believe uh, three to five holes in the middle. Uh, of the sculpture, of now the sculpture of the UltraCal jacket. Uh, here you can see that we've actually drilled holes between the UltraCal jacket and the project board platform and screwed it in. Uh, this will just keep everything nice and still. Here's the application of hot glue between the UltraCal jacket and the project board. We don't want any silicone to escape that would be very bad and waste a lot of some. Here we've also used hot glue to seal the uh, the two pieces of, of the UltraCal jacket together so in all the, the cracks we put a super uh, hot glue, sorry not super glue, hot glue. Alright so here's the pour, so Chris being the badass that he is, is pouring from six feet up. Pouring nine. Here you can see uh, silicone has gotten up to this level and is starting to bleed out. So it's nice, another nice feature of these. They release uh, air bubbles, and you can also see what the level of this is. 
So here you can see all the holes that were drilled. So in the front and the back, it looks like maybe six across the front, maybe five or six at uh, eye level, uh, one at the top of the forehead, and at the very, very top, another four or five. And that was done on the front and leave. Uh, perhaps the back just had the, the uh, large paper towel hole uh, for escaping air bubbles. I'll have to check that. So now we're uh, back the next day. It took 16 hours for the silicone to cure, and we're prying it apart using the popsicle stick routine. I had to shave off the uh, paper towel tube with a exacto knife. Uh, all the glue has been removed, obviously, before this. Uh, I had to do some more shaving of that little blue nub where the uh, paper towel tube was to get it low enough for the back jacket to pop off. Popsicle stick routine. So here you can see a little bit of the paper towel tube still stuck in there. Okay, so this was a kind of an interesting point here. So when we poured the silicone, we did it all at once. So another alternative would have been to pour this in two steps, which would have taken an extra couple of days. And instead what we did is we poured it in one piece, and then we just cut the two pieces apart. Um, the advantage to this is that it saves time. The uh, disadvantage is that you end up uh, possibly cutting your underlying sculpture. So here Chris is very carefully cutting with a head-mounted lamp. And here you can see that we've removed the back part of the silicone jacket and the back UltraCal jacket, and just leaving the front pieces. Here's the back piece. Uh, we've removed the uh, inner silicone mold, and we are releasing the uh, UltraCal mold with a little bit of Vaseline. This is what the sculpture looked like after we had done all this to it. Uh, the ears are uh, uh, a little bit of a casualty, and there are obviously some marks on the And this is our finished head uh, part of the mold, looking very nice. A uh, front of the head part of the mold. Another picture of the front head part of the mold. I think you get a pretty nice hollow mask illusion. Seems to be coming out. And as I said before, we took whatever the leftover silicone was from this process. Uh, as we were pouring, we had some left over. So we uh, poured that into uh, this rib mold and made ribs for our brush up mold later. Oh, also, uh, well. So I probably should have mentioned uh, previously that we use screws to control the uh, silicone outflow we were pouring the silicone in the first place. Uh, basically, you let the silicone drip until you get a pretty long drip out those little escape vents and the UltraCal jacket. Get a couple inches of drip, you know, three inches maybe, and then go ahead and uh, screw in very gently and not very far a uh, little, little drywall type screw that keeps the silicone from uh, escaping. Okay, so at this point we are uh, looking at a piece of foam core with some uh, paint sticks as guides to give us the, the thickness for our clay that we want. And we're going to cut some clay. So here we've, we've taken our, our molds and supported them. And we're about to cut some uh, clay pieces into evenly uh, thick uh, strips and we're going to make a, a blanket so you can see we're, we're rolling it out, rolling it out because uh, it was a little bit too thin to cut very evenly with the normal clay cutting tool. Uh, there's baby powder there that has been used to uh, release the rolling pin and also to uh, release the wood board so the uh, wet clay would not stick to it. Here a piece of clay blanket has been stuck in the, in the mold. Basically what we're doing here is we're building up the thickness of the skin in the mold, so we're creating uh, negative space. So that piece of clay there is the thickness that our I am magneto, uh, so just more building up of uh, the clay. 
So the clay has been built up on both sides with this even thickness. Put some paper towels in there to uh, keep it wet while we go to lunch. I think. So I've done a little reveal here so you can see uh, how thick the, uh, the skin is going to be. This is a random picture of the eye rig that we used for the mechanical eye. Alright, so another another picture of what's been done as far as the skin thickness. Notice really a lot of care uh, has been taken in terms of uh, the eyes and the nose. Uh, really, really nicely feathered down thinness around the eyes. Uh, the thickness of the front part of the face where all the motion is going to be is, is reasonably thin, but we ended up doubling the thickness of the clay, I believe uh, at the top of the head and, and at the back and around some parts of the neck. So it looks like uh, this is just a very uh, diligent cleaning step where uh, the clay is being trimmed. This is a picture of the finished product there. This is a picture of the back of the head. Notice that the clay is a bit thicker and that we've also put some registration marks uh, back there. Essentially for the front of the the head, the eyes and the nostrils being uh, open provide registration marks, so we don't need any additional registration marks there. But the back of the head is so featureless that we need registration marks so that our core mold will, uh, will properly register. Another picture of those registration marks, there were three. All right, now this part uh, really sucked. So we had to spray, I believe, two coats of crystal clear and three coats of shellac onto the water-based clay because we're gonna come back with some fiberglass and it really needs to be dry or else we'll, we'll have problems in the fiberglass. So we used a hairdryer for a long, long time to dry these suckers out. All right, so now we're prepared to do some fiberglassing, taking a piece of foam core and uh, added tin foil to that. So have a nice surface. We've pre-measured some resin and some hardener into dram cups. We've got our scale there to do the measurements. We used an epoxy-based fiberglass that was very nice, not very stinky at all. Have a whole bunch of chip brushes there because as the uh, fiberglass hardens, the uh, brushes go bad. Uh, and we also have off to the side some pre-cut pieces of fiberglass that we think are about the right size for what we're going to be doing. Here are those pieces of pre-cut fiberglass. Fiberglass cloth is what we used. I liked it. Okay, so uh, the initial step here I believe was just uh, uh, brushing uh, everything up with some uh, fiberglass uh, resin that's been mixed with hardener. I think I should say that I believe the uh, stone has been very well released with Vaseline before we got to this step. And of course we did not worry about releasing the silicone. So after some uh, splash coat of uh, resin, I started putting in fiberglass backing. So the fiberglass has to be so resin. Uh, this is just a very careful application of fiberglass. Uh, we used fast set epoxy fiberglass so it didn't have the working time that we might have liked but uh, it did speed things up for it. So here is the front and the back uh, with fiberglass. We used three layers of, of fiberglass for strength and this fiberglass uh, has formed our uh, core mold. But we're not done yet. We're going to use some uh, cabasil here next to an open window and Chris mixed some resin and hardener with a cabasil and used a Ziploc bag as a kind of pastry bag and he's making a thick bead of this mixture here on both sides of the fiberglass mold. I think on both sides of the fiberglass mold. And we built a special reach uh, tool here. It's a brush super glued on to a paint stick and after putting the two pieces of the mold together and clamping it down, uh, he's using some more of this thickened fiberglass and the paintbrush to apply uh, a thick bead to the inside of the mold for strength to hold the two. 
a little picture of that. And then actually uh, applying a strip of, of fiberglass uh, to the inside of the mold. So just one strip. This is the strip that was applied. So once this is all set up, we uh, break the mold apart. Using the popsicle stick routine, we're separating the mold. And here you can see the inner fiberglass core covered with clay. Uh, once again, the clay is removed and weighed, and this gives us a measurement of how much silicone we need for the, for the actual skin. So this is the part that we actually care about. We're getting closer. So we've reserved that clay. We're going to measure that to get the uh, measurement of how much silicone we need for the skin. Clamp the uh, mold together because we're not doing anything with it, so we always clamp it together when we're just hanging. So we need to clean up the fiberglass uh, core mold. So here we're uh, removing uh, the clay, just kind of brushing it off, and also using some uh, wet drywall sandpaper to sand down the fiberglass. The uh, wetness helps keep the fiberglass dust down, which is important because it is itchy and nasty. So you can see kind of rough, roughed up core mold. A little line has been drawn around the base. Uh, and this marks where we're going to cut and smooth. You can also see that there are some uh, dimples in the fiberglass core mold. Uh, these, I believe, were actually drilled uh, into the UltraCal jacket to provide uh, registration marks between the fiberglass and the UltraCal. So that's an important step that I did not mention uh, earlier. Another picture of the roughed up fiberglass. So you can see on the seam where the two sides join together. There's a lot of material that needs to be removed. Okay, and in this picture Chris has gone outside and with a Dremel tool uh, removed quite a bit of material. I believe he used a cross-cutting burr around the bottom and then some sort of grinding or cutting tool to remove the uh, seam on the sides. So it's been very nicely smoothed. And I think I get to smooth it here a little bit more with some drywall sandpaper and water. And now we're going to use Bondo to fill in uh, the pieces, the missing pieces. It's a little bit of Bondo, mostly we did Bondo in the seams. And now we're getting ready to do the brush up mold. So we've got some Smooth Sill 930. This is the same material that we used to do the inner silicone mold. But now we're going to use it to do a brush up mold of the core and make a core mold. And we're going to accelerate its cure with PlatCat. So we're going to take a 16 hour uh, cure time and try to bring it down so that we can actually brush this stuff up. Uh, I think we ended up using maybe four times more than what SmoothOn recommends because with the maximum they recommended was just not enough. Alright, so this is a splash coat of that accelerated uh, silicone. I don't think we released the board in particular with anything. Uh, I do think that we probably uh, somehow secured the fiberglass to that project board. We probably drilled and screwed it down. So here's some brushing up taking place. So once the splash coat was there, we uh, came back and did another coat with Cabasil to make it thick. So uh, one coat of regular uh, for the detail and then another coat that's thickened uh, to provide the thickness. And here you can see that once the uh, thickened silicone has begun to set, we came back and used the ribs that we poured earlier, pressed these into a wet silicone. Uh, it was mostly set up but still workable and secured it in place with some pins and these ribs will provide uh, rough registration points for our core mold and this is a view from the back. And in order to accelerate the cure time of the silicone even more, I came up with a little contraption of a uh, paper bag, which we secured to the project board with uh, pens. And we're just running the hairdryer into that bag, so it makes a little, like, kind of like a, a hairdryer at a salon. So this is our core mold now that it's uh, set up nicely. See here, 
the core mold from a different angle. We've drawn a line around it to mark where the UltraCal jacket will go, and also a line up the middle where the two halves of the UltraCal jacket will meet. This is another picture of the same. And here Chris is free-forming his UltraCal jacket. So whereas before uh, we had a lot of precision uh, because we were doing the, the uh, visible part of the skin, uh, we made everything really nice and locked up. Here Chris is doing a splash coat of UltraCal and he's going to free-form on top of that some burlap bandages uh, the UltraCal jacket. So we're not building a, a flange of wet clay or anything like that. So this is what it looked like when he was done. Uh, obviously because there was no uh, uh, wet clay or anything like that, it was very easy for him to see his, his line on top of the uh, inner silicone mold and uh, make it nice and tidy there. And this is the flange that he built as part of that process. So in this picture it's all, it's all dried and he's gone back and drilled a few holes to provide registration marks for the uh, back part of the, the UltraCal jacket and I believe uh, obviously released everything with Vaseline. Uh, here we're releasing with Vaseline so we're releasing the uh, back of the stone and also the wood around it. And when it was all done this is what we had. Uh, we had a brushed up uh, inner mold uh, sitting in an UltraCal jacket. Um, and I think you can see that he's al also inserted, uh, when he freeformed this, he inserted some pry points. I'm not entirely sure what he used for that. Uh, possibly he just put in some water-based clay. Uh, maybe that's visible in an earlier picture. Alright, so this was a little idea uh, that we had that we weren't sure if it would work, but we just tried it. We brushed in some Bondo to make a nice layer. Uh, for a new new core uh, out of foam. We used great stuff for foam because it was cheap and that's what was available. We put the two sides of the bondoed uh, uh, mold together and sprayed in some great stuff. This turned out to not work quite so. Here's some foam escaping from the seam. This is one respect and which it did not work well. Uh, we had some foam that never really set up inside and it continued to escape and create little projections from the seams for several days and generally just widen this whole thing. Alright, so this is a preliminary step to actually casting the skin itself. We use something Chris calls Super Stretch, which he got from the garment district in LA. It's used by ice skaters and so forth. It's kind of like a nylon material but it stretches only in one direction. Uh, well let me rephrase that. It stretches more in one direction than another direction so you have a kind of directional stretch which provides support for the skin. And he uh, very very slowly and laboriously tailored the super stretch so that the directions of uh, stretch were oriented properly with a motion in the face. Uh, covered all of the face very very nicely and adhered the super stretch to the core mold using super 77. So here is our prep for pouring uh, EcoFlex uh, from Smooth On into our mold. So the first thing we did is we cleaned the hell out of our silicone with uh, alcohol and actually later on we used naphtha because we had some uh, cure inhibition problems possibly from having a core that wasn't clean. Uh, we released the uh, mold with ease release, drilled some holes into the fiberglass to let air escape and also to uh, inject silicone into for the skin. Here's another picture of the same, the holes for air release and silicone injection. There's the fiberglass core mold with the syringe inserted for silicone injection. This is the scale we use to measure out fuse effects uh, silicone, platinum silicone colorant, uh, which we used. We used, uh, in the end, a lighter olive, I think the 303, mostly. I uh, can't quite remember exactly what we used now. Uh, possibly we used the, the rosy. 
So measuring with stuff out is quite interesting. You use very, 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 very little. Uh, and I think for the Ecoflex, you use probably a quarter of what the Fuse FuseFX uh, instructions call for to get, to get the color you want. Here's some experimenting Chris did with some of his own makeups uh, to see if he could get a color that, that we liked. Uh, here is the core mold with the uh, Super 77 adhered Super Stretch attached to it and inserted into the mold. Another view of the same. Here is a batch of Ecoflex that we have tinted up using Fuse Effects and that we are further tinting up using a universal colorant. This turned out to not be a good idea with platinum-based silicone. It caused cure inhibition. Here we are pouring uh, into the syringe our Ecoflex that we've uh, pre-tinted one component. We mix the two components together. We mixed thoroughly, double bucketed, mixed again, and are pouring. Um, in the end, I think two and a half minutes for the pre-mix and two and a half minutes for the double bucket mix are probably appropriate for Ecoflex. So after we've injected uh, everything, we uh, separated the mold to see what we got. And what we got was fairly broken because of the universal colorant. So we prepped everything to pour another skin, including the uh, Super 77 had to be redone. And we poured a skin just for the face. We used more of a bucket mold kind of technique. We laid the, the mold on its side to get the silicone to pool around the face just to see what was going on in the face to see if, if everything was was right. We didn't really care about the color at this stage. We just used some fuse effects just to see what would happen. And this is what we got, a very, very dark skin that I'll use for some mechanical tests later. All right, so now we're doing it for real. We uh, got some silk pig in white to replace the universal colorant. We're using fuse effects uh, for intrinsic uh, coloring and also the silk pig to lighten it up because the fuse effects was too dark. Let it all set up. Oh, let me say that uh, when we inject the silicone, we rocked the mold uh, forward and backward uh, to release uh, any air bubbles that would be trapped in the nose or the chin. Very important to do that since we were not vacuuming the Ecoflex. Uh, you don't really need a vacuum to do any of the things that we did, but you will have to patch air bubbles later on. So this is the final skin that we got. The uh, intrinsic color is pretty dang good. You can see that there's a glitch on the chin. Where the seam is, where the two sides of the silicone came together, that's something to fix. Uh, we ended up doing some shaving here so that the uh, bubbles uh, beneath the outer layer of the skin were opened up so we could fill them. Uh, ditto on the chin. Uh, this looked better originally, but we opened that up so we could actually plug those holes. And we uh, poured up some more Fuse FX and Silk Pig into some Ecoflex and uh, tried to color match it as best we could with what we already had. And then Chris uh, spatulated and very, very delicately uh, fixed these these defects. So really nice repair job. Basically made them disappear. Uh, so actually, I should say before that last photo, before that patching was done, we uh, cleaned the hell out of the outside of the silicone with naphtha to uh, get rid of any uh, ease release, which would have made our uh, new silicone not adhere to the old silicone. And likewise, Chris is cleaning the hell out of the uh, silicone skin here with naphtha because he's about to airbrush on some extrinsic color uh, using Fuse Effects. So he's basically airbrushing on uh, platinum silicone that's been colored. And obviously, for that to adhere, the silicone skin needs to be very clean. So it looks like we're airbrushing on some red. This really made it look like we made a lot of progress very quickly. 
Uh, also airbrushing on, looks like some red. So you can see here some of the red, the uh, lips were actually brushed on by hand and also the red ball in the corner of the eye was brushed on by hand. But a general kind of distant spatter, uh, kind of splotchy, was, was really nice and worked really well. Uh, coming back with some blues and purples to do the areas around the eyes and veins and so forth. Making some more progress, continuing on with the silicone painting even more progress. Uh, it actually looks at this stage that we've come back with the the fuse effects matting powder. So basically once all the color has been applied you come back with a clear coat. Uh, just spray brush on a clear coat and then dab on some of this matting powder and it really breaks up the light and creates a matte surface. Another picture of the same. Another picture of the same without a flash, I think. Another picture of the same without a flash. Another picture. Really looking nice here, some dynamic shadows. You can really see the tendons in the neck, some of the lines in the face. Uh, Chris's patching job is so good that you really can't see the defects in the chin that were noticeable earlier. Here's an up close, you can see some of the pore structure in the skin. If you look very closely, you can probably see some light blue veins. And here's a little comparison photo with Rachel uh, side by side. So you can see that the overall geometry of the head is very, very comparable. Uh, the color might be slightly lighter than Rachel. It's a little bit hard to say here. Uh, looks like I was using a flash. Um, so I think with the addition of some hair and some eyes, this will be very, very very similar.